Hi, Forrest Tanaka. A couple years ago, I decided enough was enough. I'm a photographer, but I don't understand color spaces. So that summer, a couple years ago, I sat down and studied them until I understood them. And then I made a YouTube video, which I published on another YouTube channel that I eventually decided not to foster. And the other day it occurred to me it would help a lot more people if I published it on this channel uh, where I have a lot more subscribers. So here from two years ago is a video to describe to you photographers how color spaces work and how to manage them. So hope you'll enjoy. Color is our eyes and brains perception of different wavelengths of light from the small wavelength violet to the long wavelength red, the colors of the rainbow. The mnemonic Roy G. Biv can help you remember the order. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. But our eyes feed color and light information to our brains by cheating a little. Rather than one type of photoreceptor that's sensitive to all the different wavelengths, we actually have three types of cells in our eyes. Four, actually, but we'll ignore the fourth that doesn't handle color. Cells sensitive to red light, green light, and blue light. Our brain combines the signals from these three types of cells to make a full color image. In 1931, an international organization called CIE, which in French means International Commission on Illumination, defined the CIE XYZ color space based on all the colors humans can see. They made the now famous horseshoe or tongue shape diagram most of us have probably seen. What does this diagram mean? If you look closely at official CIE XYZ diagrams, you can see wavelength measurements all along the edge of the horseshoe, from 380 nanometers for violet, all the way around to 700 nanometers for red. In fact, you can see Roy G. Biv going around the horseshoe from red orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. This diagram is obviously very non-linear, with a difference of 10 nanometers down at blue taking this much space, to a difference of 10 at green that takes much more space. This curve represents monochromatic colors, colors made of one wavelength of light, no mixing of colors. These are the most saturated or intense colors we can see, the middle part shows the colors we see by mixing these monochromatic colors, giving us colors like magenta that doesn't exist in the rainbow. Why this horseshoe shape? Well, you can see this shape is drawn within x-y axes. So what do the x and y represent? To know that, I think you have to pursue a master's degree in color theory because there's a lot of math involved. As photographers, I think we can ignore the reasons and just trust that CIE had a good reason. Just know that it had to do with human perception that CIE measured in 1931. Color profiles are files that come with our operating systems or imaging software and work with a color management system or CMS. There's one built into Mac OS X in the form of ColorSync and with some software like Adobe Creative Suite. What are these files for? First realize that, like our eyes, digital photos have pixels with color stored in three values or channels red, green, and blue. The bigger the value of each channel, the more that channel contributes to the final color. For 8-bit color, each channel goes from 0 through 255. Max out red and green at 255, and set blue to 0, and you get yellow. Or do you? To get pedantic, and we really need to for this discussion, Red 255, green 255, and blue 0 by itself doesn't mean yellow. Instead, it's a color coordinate within a color space. Now what does that mean? Think of color coordinates within a color space, like geographic coordinates on a world map. Many different world map projections exist. Mercator, Sinusotl, Eckert, Molvida, etc. They all show the same world in two dimensions, but the same coordinate in different projections are at different locations on your map. This is just as the same color triplet in different color spaces are perceived as different colors to our eyes and our brains. Let's try the color sync utility that comes with Mac OS X. I'll set the source color to full green, red 0, 
green 1, or 255 internally, and blue 0 in the Profoto RGB space, a very large, device-independent color space made for digital photography. Let's set the destination to my Epson R2400 printer with velvet matte paper. You can see that the green is much more muted because that's what Apple's ColorSync CMM felt was the closest available match in the velvet matte color space to this particular green in the Profoto RGB color space. You can also see that the color triplet has changed. The CMM is taking the color coordinates of the first color space and calculating the closest matching coordinates in the destination color space, at least as far as CIE and Apple engineers determined. Of course, everyone's eyes are different. This calculation is based on what CIE determined was the human average. Let's go back to the color sync utility and look at the Profoto RGB and the Velvet Fine Art color spaces. Here's Profoto RGB, and you can sort of see the outline of the CIE XYZ color space. Profoto RGB makes a triangular shape mostly within the CIE space. You can see the corners go outside of it, meaning it can represent colors invisible to the average person. Also notice that color spaces are three-dimensional, with the depth representing luminance, with black at the bottom and white at the peak. Now let's compare it with the Velvet Fine Art color space. This white area shows the Profoto RGB color space, and the area inside it is the Velvet Fine Art color space, and it's much smaller. That's very typical when comparing a device-independent color space, like Profoto RGB, to a printer's color space. Now, let's get rid of the Profoto RGB space so we can see clearer here. And we can see the most saturated green in the Velvet Fine Art color space is very muted, just as we saw before. Photographers also need to use the rendering intent. We saw that different companies have CMMs to map color coordinates from one color space to another. Usually a device independent color space like Adobe RGB or sRGB to a device dependent one like for a printer or a monitor. But CMMs also have a parameter called the rendering intent. The only two that photographers should use are perceptual and relative colorimetric. Both of these rendering intents tell the CMM how to map color coordinates from the source color space to the destination color space. In this demonstration, we'll use this one-dimensional image going from black to magenta. And I'll say the source color space is a device independent color space, like Profoto RGB, for example. The destination color space is for a hypothetical printer whose darkest black is a medium gray, and the purest magenta isn't very vivid. The CMM's job is to convert the source image at the top to the destination image at the bottom. If I apply a relative color metric, the CMM maps the colors of the source that are available, or in gamut, in the printer fairly directly. Colors in the source that aren't available in the destination, or out of gamut, are all mapped to the closest available color in the destination color space. This means that any details in the out of gamut areas are lost, but in gamut areas stay pretty loyal to the source. If I apply perceptual, the CMM compresses the color space to the destination color space, so even in gamut colors can change. This means it maintains more detail in the out of gamut areas, but it also means it can shift the colors of the in gamut areas. Now let's see the effects of these two different rendering intents using real software, in this case Photoshop, which has soft proofing built in so that you can simulate the mapping of source colors, like this in this image, to a destination profile of your choice. So you can see this test image going from black through magenta, and I overlaid these dots so you can see the details a little better. And I can see these dots all the way to here. I don't know if you can see it on video, but almost all the way to the corner. So now let's go to View, Proof Setup, Custom, and you can see I already put in the Velvet Fine Art paper as the destination color space, and the rendering intent is relative color metric. And here it's showing us what it would sort of look like on the printer using Velvet Fine Art paper. 
And I can see that these dots disappear all the way out here and all the way out here. That's because perceptual, or sorry, relative color metric has pinned all the out of gamut colors that were in these corners to the same magenta. And that made all the dots disappear because they were all mapped to the same magenta as well. Now if I switch the rendering intent to perceptual, you can see a big change. For one thing, I can still see the dots all the way to here. So even though these are all out of gamut, perceptual has compressed the source color space to the Epson Velvet Fine Art Papers color space so that you can still see the details in these out of gamut areas. But it's also shifted the colors. If you, I turn on and off preview, here's the original image. And you can see Perceptual has made it sort of pinkish or purplish. But if I switch to Relative Color Metric, turn that on and off, it's more loyal to the original magenta color. With the sacrifice that we lost some detail in the out of gamut areas. Now let's try these rendering intents on a real world image. This is a photo I took of a very blue sky in San Francisco. Now let's go to View, Proof Setup, Custom, and once again we have Relative Color Metric and the Velvet Fine Art Paper. And it may be hard to tell on video, but this huge swath of sky has changed into just a flat area where it used to have a nice gradient from here to here. But it managed to keep about the same hue of blue as I turn preview on and off. Now let's try it with perceptual. Now it did a better job of keeping a nice gradient from this area down to here. But it did shift the colors because notice the original is blue. With perceptual it's become bluish and a little bit greenish. So that's the trade-off. Do you want the color shift or do you not want the nice gradient of the original image. And each image is different. In this case, I think I would go for the faithful color and use relative color metric. But again, it really depends on the image. So that was color spaces for photographers. And I really hope it's as helpful to you as studying it was to me a couple years ago. Especially as you take your photos through different color spaces like your monitor and your printer which uh, can be pretty challenging. So again, I hope that was helpful and I'll talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.